All right, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, glad to be back with you guys today. I'm gonna try and breeze through some of these topics a little bit. There's gonna be a lot of redundancy from what you've seen in talks yesterday, especially from, uh, from Dave and Rafe. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about your field notes. So what you're actually thinking about in, a complete con in the, the complete landscape context of, of the species that you're collecting these inventories. So again, going back to think about day one, town introducing everybody to the whole concept of the three, three part note system that Grinnell introduced. So we've talked about field, uh, the field catalog. So that's your specimen catalog, that's your tissue catalog. We've talked about daily checklists, which is what town just went over very, very quickly. And so now I'm gonna talk about your field notebook. And you've, of course you've heard field notes used in different ways. Sometimes it's used interchangeably with your field catalog, different types of information. But this time around we're using, I'm using this term in specifically to talk about all of the extra, almost not extraneous is not the right word, but all of the extra information, the extra data that you can collect with your species inventories and with each specimen that just gives much more breadth to the data that is available to you. Basically gives spatial and temporal context to each one of those specimen data. To make this effective, it's going, you need it to be precise need to be detailed oriented and you need to be standardized. If you're using certain types of terminology, use it all the way through your field notes and ex explicitly state what those terminologies are. So if you're following some uh, standardization NRCS soil data uh, classifications, state that, use it all the way through. But we'll get a little <laughs> bit more into that. Um, and again, precision, you wanna be able to look at these notes and know exactly where you were. So 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you or somebody else can look at your notes, look at your locality information, and get back out to that exact same site and see, okay, I was at X site location 20 years ago, it looked like this, is it the same? What's changed? How has it changed? How has the species composition changed? It allows for so many more analyses, not just now, but in the future with the data that you're collecting. So what do you need to, Create a field notebook. First, you actually need a notebook. Highly recommend one that is waterproof if you can. Having said that, I've done field work where all I had was a uh, grade school composition notebook that was like 25 pages long and I kept it stashed in a Ziploc baggie. And it worked just fine, uh, but it was definitely something I had to work a little bit harder to keep safe and out of the, out of the elements. Town, as Town said, you don't necessarily have to do everything right in the site. I highly recommend at least visiting that daily at the end of every day, if not multiple times per day, depend if you're at different sites. If only because, again, you're going to forget. You're gonna, you're gonna have 50 different specimen or 20 different specimen, and it might be at 50, 15 different localities, and you won't remember all the details that you might need to remember for each of those locations. So try to keep up with it, keep it with you at all times where possible. And any time you see something of interest or that might be noteworthy, add it in. Better to have it there just in case. So the major components of your field notebook, first and foremost are the factors affecting detection of species. Second's gonna be your locality description, and then your site descriptions, and then any ad additional observations or notes. And I'm gonna walk through this step by step with you guys. Again, not gonna go into de too much detail. There's more information on the slides than I'm gonna go into here. If anything, that's more for reference for y'all later when you come back to really start thinking about how you're gonna set your notebook up for yourselves. All right, starting off with factors impacting the detectability of species. S basic information, the same things you put in all of your checklists and your catalogs, what's the date, what's the time. A lot of people use military times, so there's no confusion whether it's AM or PM. If you're using d for dates, if you don't specifically state uh, 3 March 2015, then specify what format you're using. Are you using day, month, year, month, day, year? Because that gets really confusing. You look at uh, GBIF data, for example. You look at uh, data that's freely accessible for everybody. And there are sometimes date entries that you look at and you're like, well, it doesn't really make sense that this was seen in March. So maybe, the, maybe it was a, you know input by somebody of European descent. So they put day first instead of month. Or somebody who was an American puts month first and day. So specify everything. Always be very explicit in what you're denoting there. Next is going to be weather, not just the current conditions. So is it nice and sunny outside right now? But if you're collecting frogs, maybe you want to note that two hours ago it was raining. Or for the last two weeks, it's rained every day at, from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. It's currently 7 p.m. It's not raining, but all of these 
you know, 15 species or five species of frogs started singing about 45 minutes ago, and these are the, these are the, the present conditions that we're working with. So be, don't just say what's right now, give a greater context to the whole scenario. Second thing to consider is moon phase. That's the, that not only affects the, uh, the way some species actually move about in the habitat, but it, move, it affects your ability to see some of those specimens as well. Temperature where necessary, winds where necessary, humidity, other things to consider if you're looking at aquatic systems, turbidity, salinity, uh, uh, water temperature if necessary. A lot of those extra notations are gonna be species or taxon specific. And that's up to your discretion to add that additional information as to whether or not you need that for the group that you're studying or that you might need that or might be interested in those informations for the groups that you're studying. Okay, locality. We've already discussed GPS. Everybody says take your GPS coordinates. When you take your GPS coordinates, there's some things to remember. Don't just write your latitude longitude down. Write what your datum is. Are you using a UTM? Are you using WGS84? Because if you don't specify that, maybe you're using one of the local UTMs, but I from the US am accessing your data that you very kindly published online for people to, to access, and I'm a, I might just assume, because it's kind of a sta you know, standard in many ways in the US that people use WGS84, I'm like, okay, well maybe they just use that. But if you didn't, that could throw my uncertainty off of the precision of those coordinates by maybe a few kilometers up to dozens, if not more. And that brings me to the next point of write down the uncertainty. Your GPS unit will give you a, an idea of uncertainty. It'll ha have an actual number there. <laughs> write it down because you want to be able to use that later when you're actually looking at georeferencing your data and use that in your calculations to get your true uncertainty of your coordinates. Second thing I'm going to say is create waypoints. Has, does everybody here know how to create waypoints in their GPS? You know what waypoints are? Okay, so every time you come to a new site or maybe a new specimen or a new, new study plot, mark that on your GPS. Don't just notate it in your field notebook, but put it in your GPS itself. Make sure you come up with a naming system that is standardized that you are going to remember. Don't use the naming system that so-and-so uses over here. Figure out what works for you, whether it's an acronym of some sort, whether it's the, you know, it's the, you know, date point two, you know, site number three, what, whatever it is, make sure it's something that you can come back to and you know exactly what order and exactly what, what place you were studying. And finally, false precision is another point to think about in there, is the fact that many of us, I don't know so much for the botanists, but I know especially for birders and some of the herpers, we tend to have a centralized base camp and we have, we get as accurate as coordinates as possible for that base camp, but then we might wander two to five kilometers, if not more, out searching for specimen. So if you don't actually collect your specimen in your base camp, that base camp coordinate's not completely accurate. State that. You wanna be able to say, okay, our base camp was at X location, but really I was 2.5 kilometers north by northwest away from there. Give yourself a more accurate description of where you were located when you found that specimen. Quick note on G GPS uh, satellite geometry. This adds error and uncertainty into your coordinates as well. You really want four satellites at minimum available for an accurate GPS location. You'll still get coordinates if you only have three satellites or even two, but your uncertainty and your error is gonna be huge. Another thing you'll see is what's called uh, wandering coordinates. So Town the other day had his GPS sitting out on the table. It didn't leave this compound the entire afternoon. And I wanted to cover half of Buia? No? It was a pretty extensive area. I mean, it didn't, I mean, it didn't really move from here, but the coordinates show that it looked like the GPS had moved all around the areas surrounding this hotel. And that's because he probably only had three satellites linking in to the GPS, and so what it didn't have was that fourth, uh, fourth level of information, which is, which is time. Another thing that affects your GPS coordinates and your <coughs> uncertainty, and we had a good discussion about this yesterday, 
is barriers. Satellites, the satellite rece receivers and transmitters are not sending signals through tall buildings. It's not sending it through mountains. So if you're in a valley and you've got two mountains on either side, through ca full canopy tree coverage, you're not getting good satellite signal. It's not going to be incredibly accurate. Take that into consideration. That's why we have written localities, which again, you've heard discussed before. In this case, be much more explicit than say you were R in your field catalog. Say, okay, from base camp, we walked 2.5 kilometers north by northwest, approximately we went up a slope of a 5% grade up, to, up another 25 meters or 100 meters or whatever the case is, be as explicit as possible. Give it precise directions of where and how you got somewhere. And another note on that, don't use pacing. Use actual distances because your pace and your pace and my pace is all going to be a different distance. We all have different stride lengths and we all move at different speeds. So don't use time. Don't use paces. If you do, try to find a way to convert that into an actual distance, kilometers, meters, miles, whatever the case may be. All right, moving on to site description. Site description is, you have a little bit, bit more freedom to get creative with descriptions. And again, this is definitely where you want to start getting incredib incredibly explicit and standardizing precisely how you're describing things. First, you've heard the, you heard the herpers yesterday talking about substrate. I found this frog on a moss-covered rock. We found X bird specimen sitting on a branch two to three inches in diameter of this type of tree. Spe specifically state precisely where that animal was or that plant was at the time of collection. And then you can move on that's, your, that's at a scale of like right here, my, my particular site of this exact spot where I found this specimen. Back that up, think about it at the more local scale. What's the actual habitat surrounding that specimen site? Now, ideally, you want to use a standardized classification system for habitats. Unfor unfortunately, there are n no globally agreed upon systems. There are some classification systems that may only cover six or seven habitat types. Then there are others that might encompass dozens. Depending on the region you're in, or perhaps whatever your uses may be for that, uh, for that kind of data, that's up to you. That's to your discretion to choose how you classify. But again, pick your system, stick with it. So IUCN is a good example. IUCN has a habitat classification uh, scheme that it's really great because it includes classifications for terrestrial, marine, and non-natural habitats. So that includes agricultural plots and other man-made or human-disturbed plots as well. So it gives a great variety of ways to classify and explain your system without having to go into too much detail. You can just use a couple words to explicitly describe what those habitat types are. Another example would be the FAO, the Global Land Cover 2000. And actually what's really nice if you use that system is they have a great um, they have great geospatial data that you can plug in if you're doing remotely, using remotely sensed data later in analyses. Just consider, uh, that's the, oh, this is the IUCN habitat schemes, just an example there. And you can come up with your own, I suppose, or, you can, or if you're not certain how to describe a habitat, this is just another example of if you don't really understand, you don't really know, say, what the, the vegetation composition is, you can say you can at least basically describe. Okay, I'm in semi-arid or super humid region at boreal latitude, and those are another ways to describe is just using the latitudinal or altitudinal regions and humidity provinces as well. Next, soils, incredibly, incredibly important for you botanists, and we have quite a few botanists in here, and this is really difficult. Soils are incredibly complex, and the taxonomy behind describing soil orders is insane. There's, the, the, I know they are in the process they, uh, of working on a, an international soil classification system. It's not agreed upon, it's not finished. I've seen many different variations of it, but it hasn't come together. For those of you botanists that hopefully have a little bit stronger soil background than perhaps some of us zoologists, 
If you have a classification, classification system that you're comfortable with, use it. I'm gonna be honest, soil sciences was the hardest class I took in my undergraduate career. I worked my butt off and I left that class thoroughly impressed with soil scientists and the, what they do because it's crazy. So it's, it really is. Like this is, this is a, a generalized uh, listing of the levels of classification that, of the, uh, the world reference base for the reference soil groups. And it's, yeah, it's, it's a little insane. This is a general, so the, this general map right here of Africa, these are the overarching soil orders of which I think, I believe most classifications have 12 to 16. 